morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, for some reason, this is... Uh, okay. Good morning. We are running a little late today. Took we, we were setting up in a certain place, and we had to relocate. And we're going to begin this morning by reminding everyone, of course, that the Adel Church is still uh, not meeting at the church building. We're using this electronic medium to worship together to the best of our ability. It's not ideal. I was just thinking that in the first century, they, if they met together, they had to be physically together, somebody's house. And so this is a blessing from God that we can do this this way. I am thinking that uh, you're hearing this. I've not used this setup before, but according to my computer, it shows that the video was live. And then so uh, somebody has started a watch party. All right, good. That's good. All right. The We want to remind everyone that the church is not meeting in Adel on Cleveland Avenue presently. Um, the more current information that I have is we may be doing this all the way through the month of May. We shall see how that plays out. We want to remember in prayer our sisters who, Kathy Nichols, and our sister Sharon Exum, who both have cancer, and we know others in the congregation who are still having health issues, our sister Cynthia Hay, and uh, we, we are thankful for those who are doing well. This is an unusual way of doing this, but it's the best we can do under the circumstances. We're outside today, so I was hoping we could get a little better lighting. We, uh, just Elisa and Will and myself here, and I hope that if you're able to join in, that you'll be able to sing with us. We tried to pick some songs here that we think that people will know. <clears throat> we want to sing. We want to sing it as well with my soul. If you have the book, it's 345. If you don't, it starts out when peace like a river. We'll sing the first. We'll sing all four stanzas. We don't have as many songs today. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, the best taught me to say, it is well. It <clears throat> well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul though Satan would buffet though try let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my health, blessed state, and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well. It is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. 
My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul, it is well. It is well with my soul, with my soul, it is well. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The drum shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well. Our next song in our songbook is 738, if you have one. It's um, Praise for the Lord hymn book, 738. The song is, We Will Glorify the King of Kings. We Will Glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord of the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of Kings, Hallelujah to the Lamb, Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. After this song, we will have a prayer by Will Leonard, led by Will Leonard after this song. More about Jesus. More about Jesus. 415, if you have the book. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn, more of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see. More of his 
his love who died for me. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making the faithful saying mine. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches in glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming, Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for allowing us to still worship you during these strange times. Father, we ask that you would continue to be with all of those of the church and be with those who are sick, be with those who are still having to work, and be with all of us as we um, try to get through this. Father, we ask that you would continue to be with uh, Sister Sharon Exum and also with Sister Kathy Nichols in their difficult times. And we ask that you would wrap your loving arms around them. Father, we thank you for all of our many blessings. We ask that you would help us to focus on them and to focus on you and to lean on you. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins and in Christ's name, amen. Since we got started a little late today, we're going to go ahead with our our lesson for this morning. If you're able to see the bulletin on uh, the Facebook page, you know that our text is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Paul begins 2 Corinthians 16, 4 with the word, therefore. The, the background of the things that he says here has to do with suffering for due to persecution. If you back up to the first chapter, I'd never read or thought about um, the context even of the statement of verse, verses 3 and 4. We often use verse 4 uh, for... Uh, funerals or when people die or someone's very, very ill. And he says in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Then he goes on to say in verse 5, for just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering so also you are sharers of our comfort paul and timothy are introduced in verse 1 of second corinthians 1 as being the writers of this letter paul being the primary writer but timothy being involved and they had undergone some some persecution for for preaching the gospel when uh if you'll notice verse 8, he says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. 
Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope and he will yet deliver us. And he goes on to say some other things about the church in Corinth uh, helping them. The reference here for this event in Asia occurred according to Acts chapter 19 uh, situation in Ephesus. There was uh, an uproar over Paul preaching against uh, Artemis or Diana of the Ephesians and affecting uh, the the religion and even the sales of the of little copies of, of that idol and they were severely persecuted and you want to know how bad it was how much how bad the persecution was he says in verse 9 of second corinthians 1 indeed we had the sentence of death within ourselves we have it easy in the first century at least most of us do there are some people in our world who suffer for wearing the name of christ some have suffered to death and that's that's the context, the, some of the background at least of Second Corinthians four sixteen through eighteen, where Paul says, "Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison." While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That, that's a powerful text that Paul writes. But I wanted to give you some background of the, the context of the statement. Because Paul says we do not lose heart. And... And it would be very easy for some, at least, to, to give up in, in a time of persecution against them for preaching the gospel. But if you want to make a broader application, and it's not wrong to use chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, to, to express comfort, the God of comfort, to those who are suffering uh, from a physical illness or who have lost a loved one. It's not wrong to apply that. But I think it helps to look at the the original context of why Paul said it. And and I think some are suffering now because they would really like to meet with the church. It's not easy. Uh, some are suffering from physical illness. Um, they're afraid of, of the, the consequences or at least the sickness. I'm not saying people are afraid to die. I can't speak for anyone, but I know that it's a fearful thing to be told that you may have a, a serious illness that could bring forth death. Some are suffering because their loved one is suffering. There are people who are in the church who, if they have not been, they will be suffering perhaps due to a loss of revenue because of our situation that people may lose their jobs uh, and they may have to, have to make some serious life changes. But let's look at the text for a few minutes this morning and see what we can gain, gain from it. One of the things I noticed that one of the realities of our life on earth is that man has a dual nature. In this text, he talks about the outward man and he talks about the inner man. Now, it's talking about us as human beings. Man has a body, but man within him, in that body has a spirit or a soul. And the outward man, as you know, is decaying. It's, it, we, I just wanted to share with you a piece of good news that uh, our son, Clay, and his wife, Jessica, had our third grandchild and uh, our second grandson at 1208 this morning in Kentucky. And uh, his name is Amos Glenn Leonard. And we're very proud of that uh, little blessing from God. But 
even the new a newborn child not to take away to take away any joy from having a new baby but even a newborn child is headed toward uh, death uh, eventually you know uh, hebrews 9 27 teaches us it's appointed to man to die once and so we will this outward man it begins decaying right off because we are on this physical trek, as it were, toward death. But there's an inward man, that spirit that dwells within a man. The Hebrews writer talks about the effect of God's word on that inner person, the division of soul and spirit in Hebrews 4 verse 12. But Paul says something positive here. The outward man is decaying. And some of us with a little more age than others realize what that means. And yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. Now, I want to say something about that before I go into some other points. I cannot change my aging factor. Can't change the calendar. I mean, this video started uh, 21 minutes and 14 seconds ago. I can't start it. Can't start time over. Um, and some of you said, well, I'm glad you've got a timer on that preacher because you won't preach too long today. But be that as it may, the spiritual man, we have a choice as to whether that spiritual person, that soul, that inner person is renewed. And Paul obviously has some spiritual ideas and spiritual, a spiritual destiny in mind that he's growing on the inside. Obviously, Timothy being with him, they realize that they're being persecuted, but you can't kill their spirits. You cannot stop their spiritual growth. They are allowing this persecution, this difficulty that they're facing to help them to grow and mature spiritually. You know, when we face life's challenges, it, makes, it can make us better or worse. I don't think there's really any neutral. And I'm thinking myself how we need to work on allowing life to mold us and shape us into better people and not allowing circumstances to make us worse. Worse, But there's also something else here. When he talks about this suffering, he says um, something in verse 17 about this suffering being momentary or temporary. And he calls it a light affliction. And it's producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. And we know that God has promised heaven to the faithful. But the faithful have to want to go. They have to decide what life circumstances are going to do to them and make the right choices in life. But it's interesting from, from our perspective, well, Paul and Timothy, you know, they were facing the very possibility of death. So they said, he said, in chapter one, and some people have uh, serious complications with uh, treatment for cancer or, or other physical maladies. And how can you say it's light, Paul? Why do you call it a light affliction? Um, and and of course, in and then of course, it's it's momentary. Well, it's light in contrast to some other things. And I want to talk about some of those other things in just a minute. But from a from a human perspective, saying that it's light, that kind of like, well, it's not light to me if I'm the one going through it. It might be heavy. It might be difficult um, to hear bad news and say that this, this or that, regardless of what it is, if it's a loss of your financial revenue or your physical health or maybe some challenge in your family where, People have deserted you because you're a Christian. I mean, there are a lot of things, but the the human, from a human perspective, it's not light. But Paul writes from a spiritual perspective. Let's talk about some things that would make these things light in comparison uh, with them actually being heavy. First thing is he says it's momentary. It's not going to last forever. 
I think about people who have died for the name of Jesus. Um, and we've, we've noted some of those in lessons gone by. I think about Jesus himself suffering on Calvary's cross. It was, it was obviously very painful, but it was momentary. Compared to eternity, it was momentary, even though it was about six hours for our Lord. You know, the, the Apostle Paul and, and James and others were beheaded and I, I guess the worst part for them uh, was the anticipation. Stephen was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. I'm sure that while that was going on, it was a heavy pain. But you know, as soon as he died, that, that affliction was over. It was a momentary thing. And so thinking about light things, Human suffering is light in comparison with the goals that a Christian ought to have. You know, John says, if we walk in the light, in 1 John 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I want to talk about the, the walking in the light for a moment. That's our goal as a Christian, to try and do what's right. In spite of doing what's right in spite of what the world would have us do. I feel sorry for people in the world who suffer and they don't know how to handle it. They don't know how don't have a God to turn to. They don't trust him. And it's funny. People will cry out to God at the last minute when they're really, really struggling. And I'm thinking, well, how do you relate to somebody you don't even know? I don't mean that to be unkind, but I think the Christian knows the Lord. And so we walk in the light, and through the application of God's word, we know that we can be saved eternally because the text says if we walk in the light, which is present tense, then the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That, that gives us hope. And, and we are to glorify God in, our, in this life. And you know, when... Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 16. He said, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify not you, not me, but glorify your Father who is in heaven. We should live to glorify God. It's easy to focus on self, but if we live to glorify God, it's easier. Then, of course, we need to have the goal of preaching the gospel to others. They need to know what the Christian has. Well, why, why, do you, why do you believe this? Why do you practice that? Why do you go to church on a regular basis? I mean, I go by your house and every Sunday morning you're, you're gone or you're headed out. Well, it's because the Christian has a goal of walking in the light, of glorifying God, worshiping God, and, and trying to help other people, help other people go to heaven. And when you live with those goals, the burden gets easier to bear. You know, the second thing we could say about human suffering being light is it's light in comparison with what we really actually deserve. You know, the Bible says in Romans 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. We deserve, we've earned a payday called death. Most people wouldn't view it that way, but that's what the Word of God says about it. And, and you think about Revelation chapter 20 is a very graphic text on what's going to happen to those who do not know the Lord. They're not walking in the light. They're not listening to God. They're allowing the sufferings of this life cause them to turn inward instead of toward God. And we begin all with about verse um, 10 that the text says in Revelation 20 that the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. What's the destiny of the devil? To be cast in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone for how long? Forever. And what's going? To, what will he experience? Torment day and night, forever and ever. 
The same thing for the false prophet. Those who are teaching things that are not true. I'm not talking about simple mistakes. I'm talking about salvation matters. Things that people teach that are just not true. They're going to go to hell forever. But then he brings up the judgment in verse 11. He said, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Now, precious people, we have a copy of the book. One of the books is the Bible. It tells us what to do to prepare for this day. He says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds or their works. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Now, if you go back up here in verse 10, how long will it last? Forever and ever. It's not a, an annihilation, as some teach. And who's going to be there? The devil, the beast, false prophet. And down here, we see in verse 15 of Revelation 20, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, that's a very serious and sobering statement. People think that it's rough uh, to be sick. It can be. It's rough to lose your job and go without money for a while. Yes, it can be. It's rough to go to jail for uh, certain things that a person may do that cause them to be put there. It's rough to, to be abused physically by a spouse or by a parent. Uh, life can be hard. But I'm going to tell you something harder. It's this right here. The person whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. The question is, what is actually worse? Um, doing without some things physically for a while or being in this lake of fire forever and ever? My question this morning is, is your name in the book? Are you a Christian? A lot of people claim to be, but they never have submitted to the will of God. And so we want to make sure our names are in the book of life. We have to hear, believe, repent, confess Christ, and be baptized for remission of sins and be faithful. Get your name in the book and stay in the book. People are taking risks. You know, it's amazing to me. They're all concerned about masks and, and the six-foot distance and, and, and what this coronavirus can do if they contract it and think, well, if I get that, that I, I might die. Yeah, but then what? Well, we need to be ready. There's no suffering on this earth. People say, I went through hell. No, you didn't. Nothing compares with what we just read here. I don't like to throw that word around. It's a very serious thing. People shouldn't do that. They don't realize what they're talking about. This is what, what it is. And... We deserved it. The wages of sin is death. But you know what? God, through his love, gave his son to redeem us from our sins. That's what John 3.16 really is. God's gift to man for our sins. He didn't have to do it. But God's love is greater than ours. His love for us is greater for our, than our love for ourselves. And so there's a deserved punishment but there's a loving God who gave his son, Jesus Christ, so that we might live. Let me ask you, how many people are listening to this this morning and you never have obeyed the gospel? Or you're listening to it and you're not faithful. It, it hasn't bothered you that we haven't been able to meet. You haven't been assembling with the saints in the first place. I'm thinking, why would that not bother us? Where does God want us? What we have here now is about the best we can do without taking a risk of causing people to be sick and causing people to get sick enough to die. I don't want to be responsible for spreading that. But at the same time, when all this is over, when, when these things get back to normal, 
Where will you be on Sunday morning? Will you be walking in the light? Will you be there to assemble with God's people? Will you come back and confess that you've been out of fellowship with God? When we think about it, God's grace made it possible for us to be saved. For by grace you have been saved, Ephesians 2, 8. You can't get around God's grace. God loved us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul tells us in that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Verse 6, rather. He, he, he didn't have to. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I think... Yeah, it's tough. I'm thankful I'm not sick. I'm thankful nobody in my family is sick. I, and if someone in the church is sick, I'm going to pray for them. But, you know, my greatest concern and their greatest concern ought to be is not whether they're going to die, but what's going to happen when they do. Now, throw this out for a moment. We think we suffer. What about the suffering? What about the suffering that Jesus endured on the cross isaiah 53 talks about it some but psalm 22 is a very graphic description and prophecy of the death of our lord and we have a quote from the cross in verse 1 of psalm 22 where the psalmist david said and it was fulfilled in christ my god my god why have you forsaken me Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. My God, oh my God, I cry day by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, O oh you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I'm a worm and not a man, a reproach of men, despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from my birth. Yet... You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me and as a ravening and roaring lion. Now listen. The psalmist in prophecy says, Obviously, Jesus on the cross, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. And he, and he says in verse 17, I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. And obviously, we're seeing the suffering Christ. It would behoove us to do some study on crucifixion i have heard lessons from a medical doctor's perspective it's a horrible horrible thing but the worst thing for jesus was not that but being separated from his father for a little while because you and i sinned he suffered but he suffered for our benefit and you read that in philippians 2 he, he suffered on the death of the cross for our benefit and I'm thinking, this, this quarantining is not so bad, is it? I mean, even if I were sick, I didn't, wouldn't suffer like he did. But he did it because he loved us and because we needed him to do it. You know, you think about human suffering again. Our suffering is light compared to what Jesus did. Our suffering is light when we think about the blessings that we have from the forgiveness of our sins. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us that all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places are in Christ. I don't know where you and I would be as Christians without the wonderful avenue of prayer, the wonderful privilege of having God's Word and having wonderful people teach us to it, teach it to us, 
and wonderful Christian people who care about us when we're struggling, that call us or send us cards, that really, really care. But more than that, the knowledge of having our sins forgiven. I mean, there's something that people don't understand. I know there's some people they don't think they don't understand the gravity of sin. But in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, we learn that it separates man from God. God will not hear. But David said something about his suffering and, and the value of it. And I want to do something about that this evening, Lord willing. But in Psalm 119, in verse 67, the psalmist says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. What is he saying? His affliction caused him to want to be closer to God. He allowed the affliction to realize he needed God. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. You know, the hardest time to be faithful is when everything's going well. Well, everything's going great. And it's, that's a hard and one of the most difficult times to be faithful for some people. Some people is right the opposite. When tragedy comes, they do everything but turn to God. And then I think of another comparison that human suffering is light in comparison with having Christ's love to sustain us in times of tribulation. The Apostle Paul was an unusual man. Compared to the average Christian, I'd say he's very unusual because he says in Romans 5 and verse 3, we glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation works patience or endurance. Well, that's what James teaches us that about our trials, that, that we need to let, let our faith have perfect work and, and let our trials make us better and make us more enduring as, in our lives as Christians. But how did Paul do that? He says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've never suffered from a serious debilitating physical malady. I've been in pain after some surgery, but it didn't last long. But I've never suffered a lot. But I'm thinking, and I, I've never suffered any heavy persecution. Someday I may, and someday you may if you haven't already. But we need to remember that Christ is with us, and Paul knew that. Paul knew that Jesus didn't, didn't leave him when he faced these challenges. Matter of fact, part of the promise of being going out and preaching the gospel is given in Matthew's account, Matthew 28 and verse 20, after he gives that, Jesus gives that commission, he says, Jesus said, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And I believe that this is part of it, that in Paul's, during Paul's tribulations, the Lord was with him. In Psalm 9 and verse 9, the psalmist said, the Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed in times of trouble. Somebody to turn to when things are hard, when Things are difficult when life is challenging. In Psalm 27 and verse 5, Psalm 27, 5, the psalmist says, For in times of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. He shall hide me, for he will set me on a rock. The psalmist knew that in times of trouble, He'd be in a period of, he'd be in a stable situation with God. I'm convinced that when Jesus concluded the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, he makes the comparison between the man who builds his life on the sand and the light, man who builds his life on a rock. He talks about the rains coming and the floods coming, the difficulties of life. Who's going to be left standing? The one who builds his life on the rock. When difficulties come. So when, when we understand that God's not going to give up on us, He doesn't forsake us. He never will. Now we might forsake Him, but He'll never forsake us. 
And God is not going anywhere. Jesus is not going anywhere. God's promises are not going anywhere. And God's love for us is not going anywhere. The next place, human suffering is light in comparison with having Christ with us at the moment of death. Not only while we're suffering, but when we die. There's an old hymn that I haven't sung in a long time, but the title is, I Won't Have to Cross Jordan Alone. And it's, it's a figure that has to do with death. You remember the psalmist in Psalm 23 and verse 4, though I, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. The psalmist knew that at the time of his death, that the Lord would be with him. In Luke chapter 16, there's a story told by Jesus about two men, what we call the rich man and Lazarus. We don't have a name for that rich man, but we have Lazarus's name. And we see in verse 22 of Luke 16, the poor man, Lazarus. Jesus said, Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. In other words, he died as a Jew under the Mosaic Covenant. I'm convinced there's a connection there with God's promise to Abraham that even Paul talks about that in Galatians chapter 3. We're children of God children because of that promise God made to Abraham back before he and Sarah ever had any children. That through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. What happened to this poor man when he died? The angels took his soul. You know, when we die, the angels will take us if we're faithful Christians, paradise. And one day the Lord will come back and we'll move from paradise to heaven. And I'm thinking that, yes, facing death is difficult. It can be. But the Christian's hope is knowing that when he or she dies, the Lord's going to be there. He's going to take care of us. What's going to happen to my soul? Well, what I read here is the angels will take care of it. Human suffering is also light in comparison with the very glories, glories of heaven. I believe that you have a picture of hell and a picture of heaven in Luke 16. I'm not saying that's heaven and hell. But the rich man was in torment, just like we read in Revelation chapter 20. Lazarus was in, was in comfort. You know, the Christian life is not easy. It's not easy to be faithful. It has its difficulties. We still face and have to deal, have to deal with death itself, and it's hard to give people up. It's, sometimes it takes time to, to pick up and move on after we lose somebody. But, it won't, but with the hope that we have when we lose a faithful loved one is that while it's hard, the hope and the comfort we have is that we know that they went to be with the Lord. And heaven is going to be the reward of the faithful Christian. You see that in Revelation chapter 21. He talks about the new heaven and the new earth in verse 1 of Revelation 21. And the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. There's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adored for a husband. That's the church. That's the Lord's church. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer any death. There will be no longer any mourning, crying, or pain for the first things that passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And he said, It is done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I'll be his God, and he'll be my son. And I think the Bible can only give us description of heaven and physical um, things we can understand. Streets of gold, a river of life, a tree of life, the things we can somewhat understand. But the glories of heaven are not going to be anywhere. There'll be a new heaven, a new earth. It's not going to be like here. So I think about going back then to Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18. He says this is a light affliction. Yet when we look at these things we have, it is light. And it's producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. Far beyond. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. But at the things which are seen. For the things which are not seen are temporal, but the things which, I'm sorry, but the things which are seen are temporal, temporary. But the things which are not seen are are eternal. Paul, what did you have your mind and your heart and your eyes on? The eternal. I know that life on earth is difficult sometimes, but the Christian lives for something eternal. Give up this old body that's decaying. Get that new body Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And be with the Lord be with the Lord forever if you're a faithful Christian. But what if you're not? How many are listening this morning and you know if you were to pass from this life today, your soul would be in jeopardy? How many know that right now? It's just easy to just push it out of your mind. But it's a reality. What are you going to do to make your life, life right with the Lord? You know, can't assemble with the saints. But you can always make things known. You know, if you're a member of the congregation at Adel and you're not faithful and you contact me, I'll make and let me know you want to repent. I'll let the church know. I'm not a medium mediator between you and God. I'm a messenger. But I'd be glad to make it known. If you're not a Christian, if you've never been baptized for mission of your sins and you want to do that, contact me i'll get with you and we'll talk by phone or whatever and we'll make that happen because the spiritual part of man that's the part that's eternal body's temporary the spiritual part of man is eternal this morning uh, as we bring this meeting to a conclusion you can hear mowers running and birds singing and such we're going to do the best we can we want to share with you, if you want to get yourself in the frame of mind to participate in the Lord's Supper as a Christian, if you have your emblems with you, you'll need your bread, you'll need your fruit of the vine, and we're going to give you uh, about about 60 seconds here to get get yourself ready if you have, have those things. And... Uh, and just give us about 60 seconds and then we'll get back together and begin our uh, worship in the Lord's Supper. Our neighbor's mowing, can't control that, uh, but we'll do the best we can. We're going to sing Night with Ebb and Pinion in our books. It's 452, Night with Ebb and Pinion. 
uh, Night of the Dark, Dark Wing, if you want to interpret the meaning of, this, of that phrase. Night with ebon pinion, brooded o'er the veil, all around was silent, save the night wind's wail, when Christ the man of sorrows, in tears and sweat and blood, Prostrate in the garden, raised his voice to God. Smitten for offenses, which were not his own. He for our transgressions had to weep alone. No friend with words to comfort, no hand to help was there. When the meek and lowly humbly bowed in prayer, Abba, Father, Father, if indeed it may, let this cup of anguish pass from me, I pray. Yet if it must be suffered by me, thine only Son, Abba, Father, Father, let thy will be done. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he had unleavened bread. And he said to, to take and eat, this is my body, which is for you. This unleavened bread represents the body, the suffering body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as Christians, on the first day of the week, we remember that death through this medium of the Lord's Supper and this unleavened bread. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this bread, which represents the body of your Son and our Savior, who so lovingly and willingly gave himself for us, that we might have the forgiveness of our sins. In him we pray, and amen. Bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine. We ask that you would bless it before we partake of it. Father, we thank you for Christ and for his sacrifice for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. We want to thank the Lord for this privilege we've had this morning to assemble and any who have joined in. We will conclude here with uh, one more song.
and then we'll conclude our session for the day. This evening at 5 o'clock, Lord willing, I'll have another lesson along these same lines. Maybe a little different setting, but it will be along these same lines. We're going to sing Love Lifted Me. Love Lifted Me, 421 in the book, 421 if you have a book. Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted even me, love lifted even me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted even me. Love lifted even me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I'll cling. In His blessed presence live, ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to Him belongs. Love lifted even me, love lifted even me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted even me, love lifted even me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves, he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, builds his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted even me, love lifted even me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted even me. Love lifted even me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Again, we will, uh, I'll have another lesson this evening at 5 o'clock. And also I will upload this lesson to YouTube for any who are not able to uh, view this. And Wednesday evening, I'll also be doing another lesson like I did last week. Hope you all have a great rest of the day. As soon as this mower passes, I'll dismiss us in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day. Again, the privilege we had to assemble, be with you through this special time, be with those among us who are sick, and be with us as we live from day to day. It will keep our eyes and minds and hearts on things that are eternal. And we pray your blessings on this nation that this, this virus can bring us as a people closer to you. And we pray that if it's your will, it will end soon. If not, help us to endure it. Through Christ's name I pray and amen.